Peter Singer has been called the most effective philosopher alive. His views on animal liberation, poverty and euthanasia have helped shape global debate on these subjects. And he's not afraid to leave the classroom and join the front line of protest. These days, Peter divides his time between Princeton and Melbourne universities. This week's Talking Head is Peter Singer. Peter, it's great to meet you. Good to meet you, Peter. Thanks for coming on Talking Heads. Pleasure. A journalist once said you were a man with plastic shoes and ironclad principles. How do you live out, in, in practical terms, what you believe in? Well, I suppose you try to live in such a way that you're having the least harmful impact on others, that is, on other people, on other sentient beings, animals, uh, and on the planet. And where possible, you go beyond that and you actually try and make things better, that you actually try and and help others who need it. When it comes down to choices, what does that mean for the way you live, your, your way, personal way of life? Well, for example, I, I am a vegetarian. I, um, I, I do wear, I'm wearing canvas shoes rather than plastic. Um, but uh, I try and avoid animal products because I think uh, the animal industry, factory farming in particular, is uh, an enormous uh, source of, of unnecessary pain and suffering to animals, plus uh, is not great for the planet either. Um, I try and share some of the good fortune that I have financially with some of the world's poorest people by donating through organisations like Oxfam. Uh, and generally I try and think about what I'm doing. I reflect on what I'm doing and try and work out what the consequences of what I'm doing are likely to be. Well, well does it bother you that the great majority of people don't live that way or don't give much thought to it? Yes, of course it bothers me. I mean, in a way, that's what my, my work is about. Um, you know, I'm involved in ethics, teaching ethics to students, writing about ethical issues for the widest public that I can reach. Well, do you feel the, the need to prick people's conscience, for example, when you're eating with them or when you're sitting on a leather couch, as we are? Uh, well, you know, had you not bought this couch, I guess I would have advised you to buy a couch that was not supporting <laughs> uh, animal industries, but since you've got it, you might as well use it. Um, so I'm not going to you know, worry about that. Um, if I'm eating with other people, of course, I'm not going to eat um, meat or you know, battery eggs or things like that. Um, but uh, I'm not going to rub it in their faces about my views unless they ask me, you know, why am I not eating this? Then, of course, I'm going to tell them. I'm not going to be shy about it. But I also you know, don't, don't want to be a kind of self-righteous prig who is always telling other people what to do. <laughs> so you're socially quite acceptable, are you, in company? Oh, I, think, I think most of my friends, even the friends who are meat eaters, uh, do find me uh, tolerable, yeah. <laughs> Let's see where the Peter Singer story began. My family came from Vienna. My parents were Jewish, so when the Nazis took over Austria in 1938, they wanted to leave as soon as they could. Unfortunately, my grandparents didn't leave in time, so they all got sent to camps. Three of them died there. My grandmother miraculously survived, and she came to Australia in the same month that I was born, in 1946. I grew up in a, a pleasant suburban home in Hawthorne. My father, by that time, had made a reasonable success of his business, which was importing uh, coffee and tea. As well as his interest in business, he was an amateur filmmaker. But he always made it into a story. So one of them, for example, called Quiet Weekend. Joe and my sister and I go down to the Arrow. We leave a note for them, it blows away. So they panic and they have to start searching for us and that takes them to all these places in Victoria, which my father then fits into the movie. parents were, were Jewish in terms of their, their background, their identity, but they were never really very religious. So uh, as my 13th birthday approached, the year in which uh, Jewish boys have this mitzvah, I decided that I didn't want to do that because I was not really a religious believer. It was kind of hypocritical, it was kind of would have been fake for me. My parents left the decision up to me. They never thought of sending my sister or me to a Jewish school. We were both sent to 
um, basically you know, schools that would give you the best education. So I went to Scotch College. Uh, I was interested in studying law, but I didn't want to just do law, so I thought I would do a combined law arts course. I chose philosophy. I liked the idea that you could argue about these very basic issues on which there were no right or wrong answers, and uh, gradually that became more interesting to me than law. When I uh, was getting close to completing my master's degree at Melbourne University in philosophy, I uh, was offered a scholarship to go to Oxford, um, and that was kind of the dream. Oxford was just the centre of the philosophical universe in those days. So that was a wonderful opportunity. I first met the woman who was to be my wife, Renata, in a history tutorial. We got married in 1968, so when I was ready to go to Oxford, she was able to come with me. And it was really a marvellous place then. I started thinking about ethics uh, as an undergraduate at Melbourne University and I pursued that further when I was at Oxford and I was interested in trying to apply ethics to the real world. But I'd never thought about the treatment of animals as a major ethical issue until I had lunch with a Canadian graduate student called Richard Keshen who was a vegetarian and he basically said that he didn't think we could justify the way animals were treated to turn them into food. So that started me thinking about this whole issue. I decided together with Renata that uh, we should become vegetarian and uh, that also got me interested in writing about that issue. You say you want a revolution. In 1975 I published Animal Liberation which I still think is probably the most important book that I've written because of the influence it had in starting off the modern animal movement. Uh, an example would be uh, Henry Spira, who became a close friend of mine, who had a long career in the civil rights movement, and he came into the animal movement as a result of reading my writing. And he then uh, went on to become one of the most important activists in the American animal movement. He was really the first to get giant corporations like Revlon and Avon and eventually even McDonald's to change their practices in the way they treat animals. All right.